Continuous monitoring was induced into modern day hospitals in the 1970s without any evidence on its, on its effectiveness. I mm. really want to point that out. There was no evidence on the effectiveness of continuous fetal electronic monitoring. Um, but there was, however, a big marketing push from the marketing or from the monitoring mm -hmm. industry. Imagine that. Hi, I'm Rachel, owner of the Natural Birth Site, certified birth doula, childbirth educator, and midwife's assistant. And I'm Tiffany Muniz, certified birth doula, lactation counselor, and midwife assistant. Here, you'll learn all about different aspects of pregnancy, birth, and postpartum. Remember, none of this information should take the place of your care provider and is not medical advice. Birth is not a medical emergency. Thanks for listening. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Natural Birth Talk. I'm Tiffany. And I'm Rachel. How are you doing on this beautiful, snowy, cold day? <laughs> oh, my gosh. I mean, at the moment, my children are outside, so I'm doing okay. I can't <laughs> believe they're outside because I it know. is so cold, but yeah. everybody's happy, so I'm happy. Yeah, right, right, right? yeah. It's, that's funny. Yeah. My son got called off school today and he's in the shower because it's so cold outside. <laughs> I get that. Like I get that. I, it was not a shower day for me and I took a nice long hot shower anyway. So yeah, yeah. I'm sure he'll be in there like the entire time that we're recording this. So that's perfect. That'll be great for my water bill. <laughs> okay. Well, today we have planned to continue on with our intervention series. And today we have chosen to speak about fetal monitoring while you're in labor. Yes, I'm excited about this one. Yeah, me too. Okay, so we'll just jump right into it. So actually, what... before oh. we get to that, do we want to answer that question that somebody sent us? Yeah, let's do it. So we were going to wait okay. for the question yeah. and answer, answer video, but this mama's due um, very soon. So we want to get the question answered before yes. she has her baby. Okay, so this question is, um, her name is also Tiffany. Um, oh, that's so funny. Tiffany writes, for my first non-medicated natural hospital birth, my son was born less within less than an hour of arriving at the hospital. I was 10, centim 10 centimeters when I arrived. They didn't have time to put in an IV or even print bracelets slash officially admit me. After the birth, they did place an IV and I was so confused, but was given its hospital policy in case there's an emergency line. I was given something through the IV. I assumed it was fluids. And later at my six week appointment, I found out that it was Pitocin. Mm. She said that they give it to help deliver the placenta. As far as I can recall, I was never asked if I wanted it, nor obviously consented to my knowledge. I'm assuming that the practice of giving Pitocin after birth is common in the hospital, but what are you guys' thoughts on it? That is something that I can decline, right? Fast forward to my second natural hospital birth. Placing the IV upon being admitted was the worst experience ever. Aww. I was in transition at, when I arrived at the hospital at seven centimeters. After four nurses tried and literally being pricked all over both arms and hands, the midwife came in and got it the first try. For someone who hates needles in the first place, then to go through that just to be given Pitocin after delivering the baby, I just question this practice of placing IVs for emergencies. I am due with baby number five next month, and this will be my third non-medicated natural birth. Thanks so much for the information that you guys share in your podcast. I literally listened to four episodes today. <laughs> That's so awesome. I love that so much. So first of yeah. all, Tiffany, thank you for sending us your question. Um, yes, we are thank super you. excited to be able to answer that. And thank you for listening. Yes. Um, if you haven't yet, rate our podcast. Please. Um, please. Yes. Um, <laughs> so since, why don't you want to go ahead and answer that? Yeah. Okay. So the first question she asks is, I'm assuming the practice of giving Pitocin after birth is common in the hospital. Yes, yeah. you are absolutely correct. Unfortunately, like a lot of women don't even know that they're getting Pitocin because they mm -hmm. just kind of hook it up to your IV as you're pushing and mm -hmm. start running it for like as soon as baby is born. Yeah. Without um, even telling you, without getting without consent. Telling that you, was without telling you, without getting your consent. Correct. Um, yeah. My thoughts on it are, I mean, obviously we know Pitocin is a life-saving drug in certain of course. situations. However, I don't think it's something that needs to be given for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously we know that some women are at higher risk of hemorrhage than others, but what I see a lot or what Rachel and I both see a lot, like mm -hmm. in out of hospital birth is Pitocin isn't given unless if it's like medically indicated. Right. Um, so I think that that's something that the hospital. And that's rare. That's rare and out of hospital. Right. Rates. Right. Mm -hmm. That's something that the hospital should definitely integrate into their like everyday practice is only giving 
only giving Pitocin when it's medically necessary. I think right. something also to kind of think about with that is that most women in the hospital, Tiffany, I know this wasn't your situation, but most women in the hospital are getting induced. Their labors mm-hmm. are getting induced. And we know that when women are induced, they are at a higher risk of hemorrhage. Um, right. So I do think that that's something that, you know, people should kind of think about yeah. as well. To expand on that just a little bit is specifically if you are induced with Pitocin, the problem is when you're given Pitocin, yes, it can help an induction. It can help a labor. It's done way, way, way too often. But when you, you're given Pitocin, your natural oxytocin levels turn off. Your mm-hmm. body is not making its own oxytocin near in the same amount and in the same way as it would if you were not given that synthetic oxytocin, that Pitocin. Right. Um. And so when you have Pitocin in an induction, you you really should have, studies have shown that it is better to have that Pitocin postpartum as well because your natural hormones were already not working. Well, it's not even that. I mean, it's also that your uterus has been forced to do a job it's not prepared to do. And it, well, that likely, also. It, it's all, it's exhausted. I right. mean, after it's been like overworked when it, it wasn't even ready to be worked in the first place. Um, right. You know, kind of like going off the back of what you just said, the, the muscle is tired and it has a harder mm-hmm. time working when it's been overworked. Yeah. And with Pitocin, your uterus doesn't, your body doesn't regulate the hormone like it does with its own natural oxytocin. Right. Um, right. And that I feel like we could go into a lot more depth and maybe we will in an episode here eventually. But if you don't have Pitocin during your labor, then your natural hormones have been taking over. And so studies are showing if you didn't have Pitocin during your labor, then Pitocin postpartum actually can increase the risk of hemorrhage because your natural hormones are already trying to work. Whereas um, if you did have, you know, studies have shown like if you did have Pitocin during labor, it is usually better to have it postpartum. Now that's not to say that it should be given to every mom without consent though. It should right. never be given without consent. It should never well, I mean, be given nothing without should full be done explanation. At the hospital without consent. Right. And we, so we know how that goes. <laughs> right. Of course. So all of that to say, Tiffany, yes, you can absolutely deny that. You can be prepared ahead of time to say, I don't want that unless there's no other option. Right. Um, and then also she kind of questions, um, in this, like the practice of placing IVs for emergencies. Yeah. Um, you know, that's obviously what all of the hospital providers say, like it's, Mm -hmm. it's much easier to have the IV before the emergency versus doing it in the emergency. Um, you know, when we're talking about specifically Pitocin, Pitocin can be given other routes too. So it can be given as a shot in your leg. Um, so if for some reason there was an emergency, and you needed Pitocin, then they can just do the shot. And then also there are other medications that they can give you for hemorrhage as well, not just Pitocin. And you can take those, you know, by other routes as well. So, yep, absolutely. And so for you to have had your baby, Tiffany, and then they put the IV in, honestly, there was no reason for that other than literally it was policy and the nurse was afraid she was going to get in trouble if she didn't. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there was really no need for that because if you did hemorrhage, they could have given you a shot of Pitocin in the leg instead. Um, for sure. But it was that they just wanted to hook up that Pitocin because that was policy. That's just, mm-hmm. and maybe that's what the doctor told her to do too, you know? Yeah. But. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you so much, Tiffany. Hopefully that answers all of your questions and you can talk with your provider about all of this information and, mm-hmm. you know, just keep in mind that it's important to make the best decision for you and your baby, you know, not for the provider and the mm-hmm. nurses and what makes them feel better. So yeah. Thank All you right. so much. Yes. Guys, if anybody else has any questions, please submit them because we do still plan on doing a question and answer video or not video. I'm sorry. Episode at the end of our series. So any questions, but also any stories that you just want shared, like we are happy yeah. to, to yes. um, share all of that. We'll have a whole yes. episode. Yes, please do. And you can, um, you can DM or message the natural birth site Mm -hmm. Um, social media, you can DM or message like me personally on my social media, um, on Rachel's social media, Mm -hmm. and we'll give you all of those handles at the end of the episode. So you know how to reach us. And we'll put them in the description also. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, cool. So are you ready to get started? Yes, I am ready to talk about fetal monitoring. Okay, so um, basics, what is fetal monitoring? So this is just monitoring the baby's heart rate during labor. Um, Typically, providers are listening for the baby's heart rate, 
acceleration, so if the heart rate is going up, um, and then decelerations when the heart rate is going down, how long those are occurring, and then like the, the specific timing. So like how many mm -hmm. times per minute is the baby's heart beating? Mm -hmm. um, now, there are lots of different types of monitoring, and we're going to try to hit each one in today's episode. Mm -hmm. So the first one is the most common one, um, and that is electronic fetal monitoring. So this is done by using ultrasound to measure the baby's heart rate. Mm -hmm. um, and then also, there is a pressure sensor that goes on mom's belly to measure mom's contractions. So mm -hmm. it doesn't only measure the heart rate, but it also measures how baby is reacting to the contractions. Mm -hmm. And really in the case of induction, they also are using the contraction monitor to see how many contractions you're having to see if they can up the medicine they're giving you. Right. Or um, not. Something I want to point out, though, it's a really common misconception that hospital staff are watching the monitors the whole time in labor. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, actually, it's probably more well known now than it was like maybe five or 10 years ago. But the mm -hmm. sensors are linked to a computer. Um, there's both a printout and a computer screen at the nurse's station. And then there are parameters that are set for baby's heart rate. And if the, if the baby's heart rate goes out of those parameters, it signals an alarm and lets the hospital staff know that something is out of the range of normal. So then usually the nurse comes in at that point and, you know, like readjusts the monitors or repositions mom mm -hmm. or, you know, something like that. Um, about 90% of all moms in the United States use this type of monitoring during their labor. Um, under, so it's super common. It's very common. Very it's what common. most people expect to happen. Yes. Yeah. When they and when go we think of birth. like what a pre or what a labor looks like in the hospital, we, you know, everyone, even myself, picture those monitors mm -hmm. strapped to the outside of mom's belly. So. Yeah. Um, so under that electronic fetal monitoring umbrella is what I kind of call it. There are several mm -hmm. different types of monitoring that go underneath the electronic umbrella. So the first mm -hmm. is continuous electronic fetal monitoring. So this is most commonly done in the hospital. This is electronic monitoring, but it's done the whole time that you're in labor or for the majority of time while you're in labor. So you're hooked up to those belts, which are hooked up to the monitor throughout the entirety of your labor. Then there is mobile continuous commonly done in the hospital. There are lots of different types. There are like some stickers that you stick on your belly. Sometimes you have to wear the belts and then carry the little computer with you like on your arm. Mm -hmm. um, they could be wireless. They could be waterproof, which is really great. Like if you're mm -hmm. wanting to stay mobile throughout your labor, use the shower, use the bath, you know, get up and go to the toilet, all of those things. And by and stay mobile though. You still yeah. have to carry that pole around. <laughs> right, right, right. Unless if unless if you're at like a big hospital where they have like the stickers. Um, yeah, the stickers, the stickers are nice. Those, what I don't know called? about you, Tiffany. Nogi? They're the, oh, of course I'm drawing a blank on the name. Um, I want to say it starts with a B, but. Um, well, I think they, there are different, different brands. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. But they're just like little stickers that stick to your belly and monitor baby. And those are great for like earlier in labor and even maybe active labor. But when you get further into labor and the baby gets lower down, those like never pick up the baby once baby's low. I don't know if you've yeah. had that same experience, but that's like every time. Yeah. You know, and that's when mom's most uncomfortable. And that's when they're like, okay, we have to switch over. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And then there is intermittent electronic monitoring. So this is where the monitoring is done at certain time intervals. So if you go to the hospital and you say, like, I don't want to be hooked up to the monitor the whole time, I want it just intermittently, um, then they do it at certain time intervals. The most common time intervals that I see is they want you on the monitors for 20 minutes out of every 60 minutes. Yep. So you're on the monitor for 20 minutes, you're off of the monitor for 40 minutes, and you kind of bounce back and forth. So that's kind of all of them underneath the electronic umbrella. Then there is like hands on methods. Mm -hmm. um, so this is most commonly what you see in birthing centers and in home births. Mm -hmm. um, the most common way of doing this is with a fetal Doppler, which a lot of you, when you go to your provider's office, this is how they, you know, check baby's heart rate at the office. Mm -hmm. uh, but then there are other ways too. There are, or there is like the Pinard fetal stethoscope. There's the Dele, um fetal stethoscope. Um, so different types of like fetoscopes is um, I think what they're called. Yeah. Uh huh. And and there are some big hospitals that will, or some providers really that will allow a Doppler within the hospital. But that honestly is pretty rare to happen. I I mean I yeah I was gonna say I've never seen a Doppler used like on a regular hospital and delivery floor like a labor really? and delivery floor. Excuse me, I've never seen a Doppler used ever. I have maybe three times. Never. Yep. 
Yeah. So it's not very common. So pretty much if you're going to the hospital, you're thinking of those electronic fetal monitors. Yeah. I mean, even when you search like labor and delivery or childbirth, like on Google images, like that's what's going to pop up is the continuous fetal monitoring with the belt. Yeah. Which Um, by the way, guys are incredibly uncomfortable and annoying. Yeah. Very annoying. Um, especially (laughs) as like baby moves down, um, Mm -hmm. into the pelvis lower. Um, yeah. So a little bit about the history of fetal monitoring, because I do think that's important. Um, so we think that the first time somebody was monitored in labor, like, or sorry, the baby was monitored in labor happened sometime in the 18th century when a doctor um, placed his ear on mom's belly. And then after the invention of the stethoscope in the 1800s, that became the most common way to monitor baby during labor, which I thought yeah. was just really cool and really interesting. Yeah. Um, Continuous monitoring was induced into modern day hospitals in the 1970s without any evidence on its on its effectiveness. I mm. really want to point that out. There was no evidence on the effectiveness of continuous fetal electronic monitoring. Um, but there was, however, a big marketing push from the marketing or from the monitoring mm-hmm. industry. Imagine that. Um, yeah. The idea was that this could save lives, it could decrease the rates of cerebral palsy, and then predict fetal distress. Um, its introduction was 100% experimental. I had, so I was talking to Dr. Hayes one time from um, Breach Without Borders, and um, it was at one of the Breach trainings, and he talks about how fetal monitoring is, oh, how does he say it? He basically says, It's very good at picking up the baby's heart rate. Like it's very good at knowing what the baby's heart rate is doing, but it's not good at telling you why the baby's heart rate is doing it. Right. So then anytime we see anything that's not perfect on a monitor, we think, oh my gosh, something is wrong. There's an emergency. But Mm -hmm. in fact, you know, study after study and and, um, just anecdotally also like, we have found that the large majority of the time, just because baby's heart rate isn't perfect, doesn't actually mean there's a problem. So fetal heart rate does a great job at monitoring, like fetal heart rate monitors do a great job at monitoring the heart rate, but they're terrible indicators of like terrible at actually actually predicting a problem. Yeah, for sure. He said it so much more eloquently than I just said it, but like. I know what you're saying. Yeah, no, I get it. I I know what you're saying because I was listening to um, Dr. Stu's podcast, who we've had on as a guest um, before. I was listening to his podcast, I don't know, two or three weeks ago. And he basically was saying the same thing, you know, that Mm -hmm. they, um, you know, hospital providers kind of freak out if anything goes out of that like normal range. Mm -hmm. Um, but again, it's that that fetal monitoring is not really a good indicator of like baby's well being. Um, right. So yeah. Right. So while originally maybe it was good intentions, okay, they thought it was going to save lives, they thought it was going to decrease these negative situations. But in reality, what we have found, and I know you're going to get to this, but what we have found yeah. is that it actually has not um, positively affected mom and baby outcomes, and actually has negatively a- affected mother outcomes specifically. Right. Exactly. Yep. So what about like current day? Is there evidence on the effectiveness of fetal monitoring? So I I pulled up specific studies um, to Mm -hmm. kind of like go over. So this one was a large Cochrane review of 12 studies um, in 2017. This looked at the evidence on continuous fetal monitoring versus hands-on listening. Um, So doppling basically, right? Or fetoscope. um, Yes, I believe so. And it had over 37,000 participants. Um, In those studies, there was no difference when looking at the two groups on APGAR scores, cord blood gases, rates of low oxygen, um, brain damage, um, admission to the NICU or perinatal death. There was a 50% lower risk of newborn seizures in the continuous group, but overall the seizure events were rare. So they were occurring about one one time in every 500 births, um, and when you kind of break that down, that's 0.2%. Mm-hmm. The risk of a newborn seizure was 0.15% for people with the continuous group or people in the continuous group versus 03 for people in the hands-on listening group. So kind yeah. of low so risk, no matter, changed, right? yeah, like no it's matter not, which, which way you're looking at. Yeah, um, not significantly uh, right. or not, what is it, significant? It wasn't it's not of a significant either way. Yeah, yes, it's not yeah. a significant event. Women in the continuous group were over 60% more likely to have a C-section 
and 15% more likely to experience the use of vacuum or forceps. Okay. I just have to take a hot second to talk about that. (laughs) The the only time I have seen vacuums used, it was so unnecessary and it was 100% triggered by a midwife listening to or watching a baby's heart rate and panicking because it wasn't perfect. Mm -hmm. Now in this situation, because she was a midwife, she had to call in an OB to do the actual vacuum. Mm -hmm. The OB came in and he obliged her because she was the care provider, but you could tell he was not concerned about this baby at all. He was taking his time. She even said at one point, baby's heart rate is this. And he was like, it's okay. Like, it's fine. I'm not worried about it. Yeah. And it was literally a situation where that poor mama had an episiotomy and had a vacuum extraction Mm -hmm. for her baby because somebody was paying too much attention Mm -hmm. to, to the heart rate strip, panicked, and then even though other care providers were comfortable with what was going on. Yeah. And it was a really hard situation for that mama to process. I'm sure. Yeah. Terrible. In the Cochrane review, they did not find a difference in cerebral palsy rates, which, let me remind you, was one of the main reasons why this monitoring was introduced mm-hmm. in the first place. Um, and then it's it's also important to just kind of point out, too, that variations, both accelerations and decelerations, are normal during labors and oftentimes yeah. aren't an emergency. We'll, we'll probably repeat that 8 million times. Right, in this right. Um, so, you know, everybody wants to know, does continuous fetal monitoring prevent stillbirths? Or newborn death? The short answer really is not really or not significantly. Um, The rates of stillbirths were already decreasing when continuous electronic fetal monitoring was introduced. So just something to think about. Yeah. Okay, so then what about intermittent monitoring? So that was when we were looking at continuous monitoring versus hands-on listening. Mm -hmm. Now, intermittent monitoring. So that's when we're listening to baby in at different time intervals Um, during labor. You know, one thing I want to bring up about the study you just mentioned, too, is the participants, I assume, were all low risk, which means they probably were not necessarily induced. They were mm-hmm. like naturally having their labor. I um, have to go back and look because it was a Cochrane review. It had 12 different studies. Right. So I'm not okay. sure. I'm not sure. Because there is a difference between being continuously monitored monitored when you're having a natural labor and being continuously monitored when you're being induced. Mm hmm. There is a yeah. difference. So I just want to point that out. I'm sure we'll get there, but I do want to point that out yeah. to to people because, you know, when you introduce outside substances that are forcing your uterus to work in a way it wasn't ready to, like there are well, some potential negative side your effects. baby to be born before it's ready. Yeah. 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 So, okay. Um, so jump back on to what you're talking about, the intermittent uh, The monitoring. intermittent monitoring. So there was one study, um, researchers in Sweden randomly assigned more than 4,000 low risk participants to receive either the continuous monitoring or electronic monitoring. Um, in the second stage of labor, all of the participants were, were, were monitored continuously with the electronic fetal monitoring. The researchers found no difference in outcomes when they looked at that intermittent or continuous. And the only randomized controlled trial that compared intermittent monitoring and hands-on monitoring with the Pinard fetal um, stethoscope or the Doppler, they found that intermittent electronic monitoring actually found more abnormal fetal heart rates than any of the, you know, like stethoscopes or anything. And as a result, the people who use the intermittent electronic fetal monitoring received cesareans more in that group than in any other group. So Okay. Compared so even though it was intermittent, it still resulted it in a higher rate had, of C-section. Yes, because it picked up more abnormal fetal heart tones. And put abnormal in quotes. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. So there was one that compared the, or sorry, that compared the two Pinard fetal stethoscope groups. The Doppler ultrasound detected more abnormal fetal heart rate. So whenever you're just comparing the fetal stethoscope and the Doppler, the Doppler picked up more abnormal fetal heart rates and led to more cesareans. However, the Doppler ultrasound group had the best newborn health outcomes overall. Okay. The authors concluded that the use of the handheld Doppler device is a more reliable test for abnormal fetal heart rate than intermittent monitoring or the use of the Pinard fetal stethoscope. They also know that the handheld Dopplers are simple, affordable, way cheaper than those big machines that you have at the hospital Mm -hmm. and probably cause less discomfort. Not probably, they do. Um, I know both of us used yeah. uh, the Dopplers with mm-hmm. our children. They, yeah, they also noted that the handheld Dopplers are simple, affordable, and probably cause less discomfort than the fetal stethoscopes. Mm-hmm. 
in contrast, it appears that the intermittent um, electronic fetal monitoring alone with not when not combined with other methods is not based on on evidence or research. Um, so some researchers have concluded that it shouldn't really be recommended at all, which is yeah. interesting. Yeah. yeah. And yet hospitals still use it all the time, yeah. all the time. Uh huh. So evidence on mobile electronic fetal monitoring. So there isn't really a lot of research on the safety or effectiveness of the mobile devices, but there have been two small um, pilot studies. The women in those studies did report that they liked the mobility that they had. Um, Which is important. Yeah, that's exactly. But, you know, there really wasn't enough research to say either way, if it was effective or safe or anything. Yeah. It probably akin to just the regular fetal monitor, electronic fetal monitoring. Probably kind of the same thing. You just get to move around. It's just mobile. Right. Exactly. Um, So the evidence on hands-on listening, there have been two randomized control trials. Um, They found that a handheld Doppler is linked to more cesareans for abnormal fetal heart rate when compared to the fetal stethoscopes. But without a clear difference in newborn health outcomes, um, so that would be like low APGAR scores, newborn seizures, Mm -hmm. you know, death. But the other important newborn health outcomes weren't assessed in this particular, in these particular studies. Okay. So that's kind of the down low on all the different types, on the safety, on the effectiveness. A Um, lot of information. Don't worry if you can't remember it all. It's a podcast, so you can always go re-listen to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) So drawbacks of fetal monitoring. So typically the monitoring requires a woman to wear two belts during her labor, Mm -hmm. um, which we know may restrict movement or require the woman to stay in bed. We know that like when they move around, when the woman is more mobile, the hospital staff may discourage that because the belts move Mm -hmm. around and it, it affects like how well the monitors work. Yes. Yes. Another thing that I I have. I never have actually read this as a potential side effect, but just something that I've just noticed or just really just wondered about is with how tight those belts are put on sometimes, I wonder if it restricts baby's ability to move in the womb as well. Mm-hmm. Like, does that make sense? Like, no, if, I get with how saying. tight I don't know. the belts are, with how tight those belts are, does your baby really have the freedom? Because we know to navigate the pelvis, baby does have to move and turn mm-hmm. and, and and do these cardinal movements. Mm-hmm. And with how tight those belts are, is that yeah. restricting certain babies from the ability to make those cardinal movements? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or to yeah, get I into mean, a better I think, position? I think maybe with like... uh yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm sure a case could be made either way, like yes or no. But I feel like specifically with larger mamas like myself, you know, they really have to like tie them in tight. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it, it honestly wouldn't surprise me if it, I mean, certainly it affects it a little bit, you know? Yeah. Yeah. The fetal monitoring, it also may make it more difficult to utilize water as a comfort mm-hmm. measure if, like, the the facility doesn't have waterproof monitors. We know, like, because we just went through all of that information, it, you know, it may increase the risk of a C-section for moms. Yep, the monitor, um, yeah. Yep. Another potential downside of the electronic fetal monitoring is that the sounds or display from the monitor <sighs> could distract the moms while they're in labor, yeah. which this is, like, one of my biggest complaints. Yes, um, Because it can then lead to an increase in their perceived pain and increase Mm -hmm. their stress during labor. Or Um, she's trying to sleep and rest and the machine won't stop going off. Boop, 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 boop. Yeah. Or the the ding. Uh (laughs) Like, I feel like I hear that in my nightmares. (laughs) That I have had several, um, you know, probably like, I don't know, three or four times where the mom had experienced birth trauma. Well, mom and dad had experienced birth trauma in their previous pregnancies. Um, because of like baby's heart rate, they got taken back for like an emergency section or something mm-hmm. like that. And then I was with them for the next baby. Yeah, no, like we have had to ask the nurses to turn it all the way down so that we can't hear it at all. Mm-hmm. Um, cover the monitors with, I mean, I remember this particular birth that I was at, the dad was so laser focused on the monitor and what the monitor was doing. Uh-huh. I it had creates to cover a lot it. of anxiety. I had to cover it with a blanket. And after that, finally, he he was able to like calm down. Um, yeah. But yeah, it creates so much anxiety. And then we know that when when we have anxiety, our stress hormones are increased, and then our bodies can't produce oxytocin as effectively, yep. which you know may slow down our down labor or yep. make our pain increase. So yep. all something to kind of think about. Yeah. 
Non-reassuring heart tones is the second leading cause of C-sections in the United States. That is perhaps the most important risk of using the electronic fetal monitors. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. And really to be aware of is the effect on, on cesarean rates. Mm-hmm. In the U.S., um, it's the second most common reason for first-time cesareans after failure to progress. So, Which is failed- really just code for provider impatience. Yes, for sure. Because non-reassuring fetal heart tones can be a vague diagnosis, um, Mm -hmm. several professional organizations in the United States came together to decide upon a standard approach to interpreting and managing the fetal heart rate tracings um, Mm -hmm. with a goal of preventing unnecessary cesareans. Because Um, here's the deal, you know, something we haven't said yet on this episode, but like we keep saying cesarean, 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 and and there could be listeners out here saying, well, that's good. That's Mm life-saving. But honestly, guys, and yes, there is a time and a place for cesarean section where it is life-saving and wonderful, and I'm so grateful for them. But the large majority of C-sections in the United States are unnecessary. Uh And then cesarean sections have a whole host, many, many, many more potential risks and potential side effects in the short term and in the long term compared to a vaginal birth. For both for mom no, and for, baby. Yep. For both mom yep. and baby. <laughs> Took that right so out of your mouth. <laughs> yeah. No, seriously though. It's because we're yeah. doing the same thing. Great minds. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like, so when we say it's an increase in cesarean, like that's not a good thing in mm-hmm. this case, in the topic that we're talking about. Because right. they're not necessary cesareans. So then we're causing yeah. all of these unnecessary risks. Right. Exactly. And side effects. Yeah. Yep. So research also shows that people who give birth in upright positions, which Rachel and I are definitely fans of, are 50% Absolutely. less likely to have abnormal fetal heart rate patterns. Mm-hmm. Um, researchers believe that when people labor and give birth in upright positions, there is less risk of compressing uh, mom's aorta, mm-hmm. uh, which means there is a better oxygen supply to the baby. However, continuous electronic fetal monitoring generally restricts people to bed lying positions. Now, and when I say restricts them, it doesn't, I'm not necessarily saying that the hospital staff is making people stay in bed, which some are, and I have seen, but I feel like moms feel like they can't get up and move around when they have those, um, those belts on. Yeah. Um, Or, or they just get sick of the staff constantly coming coming in and messing with them. So they just give up. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So having the mom change positions may be helpful for relieving umbilical cord compression that can also cause abnormal fetal heart rate um, Mm -hmm. patterns. So the bottom line is that hands-on listening is more effective at detecting issues with baby and is more comfortable for mom. Like we know this. So why don't more providers and more locations use this method? The first and probably most important is Mm -hmm. liability. Ding, ding, ding. Um, Yeah. (laughs) So one of the main reasons that electronic fetal monitoring is so common is that doctors, nurses, midwives, and hospitals think that it protects them from cerebral palsy lawsuits. However, the introduction of electronic fetal monitoring actually had the effect of increasing rates Mm -hmm. of medical malpractice lawsuits. So isn't that kind of silly? It is. It's all silly. (laughs) Back when hands-on listening was used, the care provider would write down what they were hearing, but there was no continuous strip or printout recording Mm -hmm. of the heart rate. Um, there was low, a low rate of obstetric malpractice because there were no records to challenge the hospital's side of the story. Mm-hmm. After electronic fetal monitoring, physicians relied on the new electronic fetal monitoring recordings as their mm-hmm. defense against the cerebral palsy lawsuits. However, the technology was used against them in court and trial lawyers for parents were able to win billions in lawsuits against physicians. <sighs> I hate that. I hate that so much. Birth, like... Birth yeah. should not be medicalized just for somebody else's convenience or somebody else's like fear. Yeah, yeah. And that's what so um, much of it is. I also just want to point out, I got a, a lot of this information from Evidence-Based Birth, um, which is a great mm-hmm. resource when it comes to um, lots of different like interventions and labor. Mm-hmm. So definitely check them out. Another I will I- have to say, I do really like Evidence-Based Birth overall, but there are some things that I'm not a huge fan of. I mean, of. for sure. No no place is perfect, right? Right. Well, and yeah. you have to remember, too, that, like, yes, evidence is great, but there are so many things we don't have evidence for, and that doesn't for make sure. them invalid. No, for sure. I, I 100% agree with you. But it is and still a great next, place to start. The next episode that we do, I think that we'll talk a lot about that specifically. Like, awesome. what the research shows and, like, what traditions and cultures have done in the past. And yeah, yeah. which is so important to consider. It really is. It is so, so important. Um, The next one is time. So the use of any hands-on method would require the nurses or the providers to be at the bedside, you know, every 15 to 30 minutes during the entirety of labor, which like 
I don't know. This is like so silly to me because, you know, that's, that's what you're what, getting paid what for. We do. <laughs> well, and not only that, but like, that's what we do at home births and birth centers. And it's yeah, like, it's so true. That's, that's like, yeah, I don't know. It's so silly. Yeah. Um, resources. So most hospitals, which is so dumb don't have Dopplers on their floors, which is so silly because they're mm-hmm. so much cheaper than those big, huge machines. And like, they're so much easier to like use and easier to of like thousands of dollars. I'm talking, right. I'm not just talking about like a couple hundred dollars. Like well, those and machines if, are so expensive. They really are. They really are. I and know. if like something, like if you have to like figure out something go wrong, going wrong with a big machine versus a Doppler, like it's so much easier to like troubleshoot the Doppler. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. At the end of the day, the electronic fetal monitoring industry is a $3.6 billion industry. You always got to chase the money. $3.6 billion Mm -hmm. industry. That's That's all I'm going to say about that. So much. Yeah. Training. So nurses, and this is like not a dig at nurses. This is just what it is. I mean, I'm a nurse myself. So nurses have zero training on any hands-on methods. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In nursing school, like we didn't do any training on hands-on listening. Yeah. It's Um, a dig at nursing schools. (laughs) Right. Yeah. 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 Like, come on guys, it's going to take you 10 minutes to teach somebody how to use that. Like the nursing school I went to was phenomenal and amazing, but, um, you know, it's just, it's not what we learn. Um, and then staff views and bias is, very, mm-hmm. very important. You know, think about it. Like you're this new nurse who comes out of nursing school. All you know about is is electronic fetal monitoring. Yeah. You've been taught that that's the safest way to take care of mom and baby. You know, it's like hard to change your ways. As unfortunate For as sure. it is, you know, the staff honestly just think that this is the best way to do it. So, yeah. Well, and it's hard for people to think that what they know may not actually be accurate. Like, it's hard for them to think outside of what they know. Like, you only know what you know. Mm -hmm. And for so many of us, it's hard to to think about things differently. Like, that can be a struggle. Um, Really quickly, though, sorry. I just want to make a plug. Hey, listeners, you guys are hanging in with us. This is so much information. This episode is longer than most of our other episodes. But keep hanging in there. Like I said, you can always re-listen to the episode we just want to be able to get it out there for all of you guys to have it like yeah we're almost done we're almost we're getting there almost Almost there we're almost at the end here so I thought it would be really cool to kind of look up what the professional guidelines are from all of the like professional organizations Mm -hmm. so the first one is ACOG um so that's the American College of Obstetrics and Mm -hmm. Gynecologists Um, So ACOG has endorsed hands-on listening as an appropriate and safe alternative to the electronic fetal monitoring for laboring people without complications. So they made that statement in 2009. Um, So it's been a while. Yeah, it has. But they strengthened that position in a 2017 committee opinion called Approaches to Limit Intervention During Labor and Birth, where they state that continuous electronic fetal monitoring has not improved outcomes for women with low-risk pregnancies and recommend that care providers should consider... Uh, sorry, care providers should consider training staff to monitor using a handheld Doppler device, which Mm -hmm. can facilitate freedom of movement um, in which some women find more comfortable. So that was Mm -hmm. in 2017, um, number 687 statement, I believe. Yeah. ACOG also states that hands-on listening may not be appropriate for people when they have an increased risk of complications. So that would be people with meconium staining, bleeding during labor, suspected fetal growth restriction, preeclampsia, prior cesarean, type one diabetes, or receiving Pitocin, which now we also have evidence that some of those aren't necessarily true right. or, or are high risk. So I was going to say, I want to say it points that, out. It says may not be appropriate. Right, it doesn't exactly. say is not. And another thing to keep in mind is a lot of the ACOG guidelines, not all of them, but many of them are based on what you said, committee opinion. All mm-hmm. that means is they asked a bunch of doctors their opinion on it. And put out a statement about it. Right, exactly. So, you know, this opinion I particularly like overall. Hey, let's increase Doppler use. I think that's a great opinion. Okay, also, but like, I don't know, maybe you should take this part out. But like, uh, it's all just a bunch of like, white males who are making these committee opinions. So, yeah, you know, I don't know how everyone feels about that. So, yeah, well, it is. But seriously, (laughs) though, because like, I mean, you and I both know, like, we've supported um, VBACs at home. Oh, with yeah, yeah. Doppler monitoring. And we have mm-hmm. found that that is safe. And there are yeah. studies to show that that's safe. So just because I guess all I'm saying is just because ACOG makes a statement 
doesn't mean it's like 100% perfect. I mean, I do yeah, think sure. that there are a lot of good guidelines that they put out there, but it's not like, and, and for any of these organizations, it's not like you have to follow it. Right. Yeah. And many doctors yeah. ignore them. So. Yeah, oh, for sure. Yeah, they do. <laughs> Um, so the ACNM, which is the American College of Nurse Midwives, states that hands-on listening, not electronic fetal monitoring, should be the preferred method of fetal monitoring in people that have low risk, a low risk of complications. So mm-hmm. that statement was made in 2015. Um, the Society of Obstetricians and Gynecologists of Canada, um, they state that there is no evidence to justify the use of continuous electronic fetal monitoring in routine mm-hmm. practice and that hands-on listening is the preferred method of fetal monitoring for low-risk women. So mm-hmm. pregnant women at term with a single healthy baby with spontaneous onset of labor with no previous cesareans, no maternal pregnancy or labor complications. So that mm-hmm. was in, I believe, 2007 that they made that statement. And then NICE, which is in the UK, um, the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, Those guidelines advise care providers not to offer electronic fetal monitoring to women at low risk of complications during labor. That was in 2017. Instead, the guidelines suggest that low risk laboring people should be offered hands on listening with either a Pinard fetal stethoscope or a Doppler ultrasound. If the fetal heartbeat is abnormal, they recommend that the first step should be listening more frequently and assessing the mother's overall condition, such as her position, hydration, and other maternal observations. Continuous electronic fetal monitoring is recommended if the fetal heartbeat remains abnormal, but the mother should be offered hands-on listening again after 20 consecutive minutes of the normal electronic fetal monitoring readings, like ACOG. Mm-hmm. NICE guidelines also recommend electronic fetal monitoring with certain risk factors, including those receiving Pitocin. I love that particular guideline because they're like, hey, just because it was abnormal for a hot minute doesn't mean we're going to keep you on it for the rest of your labor. Exactly. Love that. I think that's awesome. Um, yeah. I do want to put special emphasis on if you are receiving Pitocin. I also, if I think if you have received Cytotec, mm-hmm. I think uh, Cytotec is another one that you really should be continuously monitored with at least for a few hours with Cytotec, but the entirety of the time you're on Pitocin. Yeah. You really should be continuously monitored because it's messy with the whole system of birth. And we have found that just Pitocin use in general can put a baby in distress. Um, right. Yeah. Just from overactive uterus. The same with Cytotec. And overactive uterus is like the number one reason. Hyperstimulation. Um, yeah. Hyperstimulation. Yep. So, so that is definitely a time where you would want continuous monitoring or at least mostly continuous monitoring. Right. Um, exactly. Obviously, you can take it off to go pee. Like yeah, that's fine. Sure. Please do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, I mean, even in situations like some of these low risk guidelines, like, you know, in situations, a previous C-section, um, baconium staining, like some of those things, those are gray areas of, okay, right. yes, they are recommending continuous monitoring, but there are a lot of people who disagree with that statement. Yeah. Um, And so it really is coming back to like what we say so often is trust your instincts. Mm-hmm. Trust your mama instincts, trust your body, trust your baby. If something feels glaringly wrong to you, say so. Even if, I mean, if they're like wanting continuous fetal monitoring and you just are, you know, everything's fine, say so. I don't care what hospital policy is. You have the right. And in the last episode, we mentioned asking for a patient advocate. Mm -hmm. If the hospital wants to keep pushing their policy, you can get a patient advocate. If you really feel like it's unnecessary on the flip side. If they're like, no, intermittent monitoring is fine. And you're like, no, I I really think something is wrong. You need to trust that as well. For sure. Like, trust your instincts. 100%. Agreed. Period. Point blank. Always. Always. (laughs) (laughs) Because you know your body and your baby better than anyone. Better Um, than anyone. And and hospital birth, I mean, it's an expense. They make a lot of money. It's yep. an expensive industry. People mm-hmm. want it to be in the hospital. Hospitals make a lot of money off that kind of stuff. They make even more money off of C-sections. Yeah. Um, and and not to say that no birth belongs in the hospital, but most births don't. Yeah. But if you do have to be in it, you want to be armed with all of the evidence and all of the information you can in mm-hmm. order to to have the safest birth for yourself and your baby. Yep. Agreed. Anything else? No, that was all I had. All 85 pages. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, yes, it was like long, it was a lot of like dense information. Um, But it's all information that everyone should be aware of, you know, especially if they're going into a hospital birth, 
you know, it's important to know and to be able to advocate for you and for your sure. baby if there's something you want or don't want. So absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. And I will say this, I will be the first to admit that I thought with my first birth, I thought I was educated. <laughs> and then I went in and I was like, I know nothing. Yeah. So, you know, it's you really, especially for a hospital birth, you really do have to arm yourself with the information because they are really good at telling you different things. Yeah. yeah. And getting you to do what they want you to do. Yeah. And um, you know, there are plenty of nurses out there that don't do that, but there are plenty that do do that also. So yeah. you just you have to be prepared. Okay, Tiffany. Let's mention our personal social, our social media handles. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so you can find me on Instagram at the doula Tiffany. Uh, my website is www.thedoulatiffany.com. And then Facebook is facebook.com slash the doula Tiffany. All very easy to find. Yep. You are very easy to find. And then the handles obviously for the natural birth talk are also for the natural birth site. So um, the natural birth site is the website at the natural birth site.com. And then that also houses, you know, you links to the podcast, but our social media handle as well is at the natural birth site. So it's not the natural birth talk. It's at the natural birth site, both on Instagram and Facebook. And then my personal handle, if you want to check out my stuff too, is at Rachel Mann's doula. So uh, those will be linked in the description. Yeah. Uh, you know, Tiffany and I, we run our natural birth site page just a little bit different than we run our personal pages. So it's just different to follow our, our natural birth site and the natural birth talk page versus yeah. our own personal pages. You're going to get different information, see different things. You're going to yeah. get to know us personally a lot more on our personal For pages. For sure. Yeah. Our personalities and yeah, feel free to like reach out to us, ask us any questions. Um, yes. We're happy to like read your questions on air whenever we record or if you mm -hmm. even or stories. have stories about mm -hmm. like the things that we're talking about. Um, we're happy to like read those on air. Yeah. We love personal stories and, you know, sure. we do the best to share stories with while still keeping our clients, you know, privacy protected. Yeah. Um, but if you guys have stories you want us to share, like, you know, we are all about that kind of stuff because I, that's the best way to learn, honestly. For sure. I agree. I For agree. Sure. Yep. So, um, Yay. okay. So one last thing, rate our podcast already said Please. it. Um, Please. and share you, it with your friends. Yes. If you need an online natural birth class, um, natural birth site has one. It's pretty inexpensive. It's $65. If you hate it, I'll give you your money back. Um, but I don't <laughs> think you're going to hate it. So, um, check all of that out guys. We love so much that you hung in there for this long episode with us. Yes. yes we yes. appreciate it so much. Um, we really hope it's really helpful information and we're going to keep going with our intervention series for at least a few more episodes. Yes. We yes. got a few more planned out. So yes, we do. I'm All really right. excited about the next one. Yes, me too. So we can't wait to talk to you guys in the next episode. Bye. Bye. Hi, Rachel Manns again. If you want to learn more, please subscribe to and rate this podcast and head over to thenaturalbirthsite.com to check out our online natural birth education course, birth story blog, YouTube channel, and more.